get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars, Atari, P90X, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, especially check out the episode with Noah Alper. Um, basically, he tells a story of how he sold his chain of bagel stores to Einstein Bagels for $100 million. But the best parts of the story, Anthony, are not that, in my opinion. It's he shares the businesses that didn't work. So that he was, you know, buying and selling religious tchotchkes and selling them out of the back of his car and the business did horribly. And it was good to see his iterations of how he came to the bagel stores. Um, today's episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. Uh, we do it in three ways. A done-for-you media, where we help you completely run your and launch your own podcast get it published across 11 different channels, blog posts. I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life, allowed me to form amazing relationship. Um, And the second is our done for you lead generation where we manually send consistent flow of customized outreach messages to your ideal clients and referral sources. We also do done for you VIP events for software companies and conferences. We may or may not have showed up in Elvis costumes at one of them. Um, so I am very excited for today's guest, long awaited. Today we have Anthony Constantino, the co-founder of Sticker Mule. It's one of the most popular custom sticker websites with printing operations in the United States and Europe. Sticker Mule is the easiest and fastest way to buy custom printed products. You can order in simply 60 seconds. They turn your design or illustrations into custom stickers, magnets, buttons, labels, and packaging in a few days makes it look really professional. Their customers have included companies you may have heard of, Amazon, Nike, Google, Facebook, Netflix, and many more. And I'm going to have them show a few of them, but they've given me um, the authority to give us amazing deal, which may or may not be available when you go to this page. So the amazing deal is 10 custom stickers for a dollar. That doesn't even pay for shipping, by the way, just a dollar. Typically, it's $20. So if you go to stickermule.com slash inspired, you know, Anthony, I've announced this, you know, before, you know, after I introduced the guest and the person who's the guest is writing it down because they obviously (laughs) are going to order the stickers. And I said, listen, if you go to the site and it, you know, this goes viral and they can't, you know, fulfill on all of them because they just, it, it's a loss leader for them that they know what I tell people is, you know, they know when you get the stickers, you're going to order more because they're amazing products It may be stickers <laughs> and maybe other things. So they hook you with that because they know you'll love it and you'll go back for more. But if you go to the site and we will have something amazing for you, if that dollar for 10 stickers is, is not there anymore. So Anthony, <laughs> thanks for joining me. Awesome. Great so show to be me here. some of the product first. You know, I made you right, go well, and, actually, and grab a few things. Yeah, I went and grabbed some, but the only thing I had immediately available actually is uh, you guys get the exclusive on a new product we're launching next week, which is uh, custom coasters. Oh, cool. So, have you got a lot of demand for first that? Or? Uh, you know, we like to do things to amuse ourselves. And I think we were, <laughs> we were out at a bar one day and we we're like, why don't we make coasters? And then the next day we, we bought some coaster equipment. So we've been teasing it for a while on Twitter and social media that we're, we're doing coasters. We, we actually wanted to launch just before Christmas, but uh, I put a halt to it because uh, we wanted to get the, the manufacturing nailed down a bit more, but we're, we're launching next week custom coasters and this is the first look at them. That's awesome. So full color coasters, you can buy as few as 10 or, you know, as many as 10,000, whatever you need. That's what's really interesting about your site. What I find is you don't need to put an order in for like 3,000. You can order Mm -hmm. a small quantity. What Mm -hmm. made you decide to do that? Because obviously, probably manufacturing wise, that's a nightmare just to do a real small order. Well, oh yeah, that was fun. There's there's more people in the world that need small quantities than need large quantities. You're dealing with large quantity business and you're dealing with um, big customers that tend to be a lot harder uh, harder to work with and 
And so yeah, we, we wanted to go do a mass marketing service and have an have ability to build a, a brand. And you can't build a brand if you're dealing with large cost, with solely large customers. It's really hard. Yeah. Cause people, you know, people don't know you. You could be in, there's some enormous companies out there that go around connecting with fortune 500 companies and getting huge contracts. But, um, but, uh, you know, we wanted to build a brand. Probably, I imagine even larger companies may just start with a small order to test it out also. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I say, you know, early on, I said we kind of have the uh, the Dropbox model. If you follow Dropbox early on, I've been around for a while now. But if you remember the early days of Dropbox, a lot of random consumers were just using it. And it, you know, became viral within the organization. And, you know, the Dropbox ended up becoming enormous. But, uh ended up uh yeah the, the the individuals in the organization trying to end up pushing it throughout the organization totally We've had that same experience with customers like google and, and people like that where you get a guy at 550 stickers but you know will, will a random person like is there an example where there was a big company with the random person who works at the company buy the company stickers or would they just a random side project oh, a lot they of have? times they buy for themselves yeah yeah, like, like what do they buy? Like a... small, I mean, people might buy stickers for their kid's birthday or, mm. you know, when uh, people are involved in nonprofits or, you know, they got their kids on a little league team or something, something of that nature. So, I don't know, if they're doing some side project and they buy for that, but then, they, you know, they tell their coworkers right. or, yeah, within large organizations, there's people that need things for, for various reasons. Like Anthony, so you started off as stickers, right? <laughs> At what yeah. point did you branch into something more? And I want to hear what are some of the most popular besides the stickers? Because what I know you for is stickers. Like you're walking around trade shows, uh, you know, I like go to your your guys booth and you have like every possible company, you know, that <laughs> you displayed there. And I grab a bunch for my kids. But what have you branched into? What was the kind of the evolution after stickers? Uh, you know, we started with stickers. That's a good, that's a good question. I, I don't even, you know, the recall the exact evolution. We started with stickers. We always want to do things that are a bit on the easy side. When we started with stickers, for example, I told the story to other people, but uh, me and my co-founder were, were both involved in manufacturing our whole lives. And we just wanted to build a manufacturing company that connected directly with customers because traditionally, they didn't traditionally manufacturers sold through distribution partners, and we just found that frustrating. We wanted to, we, we, we wanted to have our factory talking directly to the customers. Yeah, and so we got this idea. Me and him talked, and we said, "Let's let's let's do it." Or he actually said, "Let's do it." And um, we ended up, you know, he ended up putting up money, and we we moved forward almost immediately the, the day we had a conversation together. And we ended up settling on stickers, really, because it was, it was rather easy to get into. So I think when we started, uh, you know, we started with stickers because it, was, it was, wasn't the hardest thing in the world to make, although it turned out it was harder when we realized we made a bunch of mistakes early on that we corrected. And then from there, we went to buttons because we said, well, that's, that's not that hard either. And, um, you know, we can leverage the brand and leverage the customers. So we, we went after that market. We wanted to do some another thing uh, relatively easy. Um, and then from there, I said, well, we've done two products that are rather easy to make, although... Um, yeah, I would say stickers aren't as easy as people realize now that we've been into it for yeah. eight years. We've made a lot of advancements to the process. So buttons, that's the reason I asked because you are, you know, dealing direct to the customer. So you probably get a lot yeah. of feedback and a lot of requests, some of which you're yeah. like, we can't do that right now. We have so many things in the pipeline and some of which you're like, hey, we'll like the coasters, we'll try this out, right? Yeah. So what like is it? Yeah, I mean, there's not so much of a thought process behind these things. I'll say this: like, after buns, we went into labels, and and labels was interesting because it's actually a much more complicated manufacturing. It's much harder to get into labels than it's to get into buns or stickers. Anyone, well, years ago, anyone could get into stickers without a lot of capital, without a lot of experience. And buttons is even easier. I mean, you could go online and Google how to make buttons and you know get started with your paycheck for the week. Um, but uh, that was a rather easy easy product to do. Labels is significantly more complicated manufacturing we wanted to try something something harder um mainly because it's a bigger barrier to entry right bigger yeah process than an easy manufacturing process and a lot of things we, we rely on serendipity to make our decisions i'm not a big planner um I'm, yeah i'm not a big planner uh, you know what's but, interesting also is well, one of my favorite stories is your i don't know if it was your first customer but um one yep. of your first customer stories where you offered them free stickers and yeah. what happened well our first customer was actually github 
and we, we had just gotten started, our developers that we had contracted to build the service because we didn't know how to build websites back then, but um, they connected us with the founder, one of the founders of GitHub. He said, I'd love to try you guys out. And I was so excited to talk to the founder again. I said, well, I'll do an order for you for free. And he, he asked for a rather large order. I was like, well, I already promised the free order. I guess I have to, I guess we have to do this. But we were just what getting was started. Order? It was, it was 10,000 units, which for us at the time was, a, you know, was a lot. And, um, he's like, you know, a free order. I'll have 1 million stickers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah. I'm just going to take all advantage of this guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't think he thought he was being unreasonable cause that's probably, that's what they bought. I mean, they buy a lot of stickers, but, um, right. we did 10,000 stickers for them. We shipped it to him and he told me the stickers were terrible. And you know, that was very helpful because you know, we were, we were about to go to market with a product that didn't work, but it turned out we thought stickers were easy, but it turned out we had the wrong material. We had the wrong printing technology uh we had the wrong adhesive we had a lot of things wrong and i think we ended up doing four iterations for github wow. for free probably close to 40 or fifty thousand free stickers Jeez. before before we got a product that he liked and we ended up winning his account and uh before we even went to market before the website even launched we ended up winning his account and and that helped us go to market without really embarrassing ourselves what was it um the improvements you had to make well early yeah. on t- <laughs> you know the we were using the wrong, um, we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we went to material companies that we want to make stickers and they, they gave us material. We thought it made sense. We were like, we want the highest quality material you can, ha- you can give us. So he gave us this like extra thick material. And they were like, Oh, this is the thick material. This is the expensive one. It must be good. It looked nice, but because of the thickness, it didn't actually adhere very well. So you would put it mm. on the thing. It would fall off after a few days. So it looked nice, but it wasn't, adhering how it should what the idea because of the way the material structure would fall the sticker would fall off rather easily um we had to adjust that we we brought the wrong printer initially and then the the print uh yeah the print quality just wasn't very good we didn't know how to match colors that was a bad battle people would ask for you know their specific color we didn't really know how to match colors it was it was a long long learning process so those were the main ones colors material wrong material selection and uh so quality. what else, Anthony, have you learned from dealing direct with the customer? What, is, what else, you know, that early on, obviously, that helped from the initial iteration of the sticker. What other, I guess, feedback have you gotten that you've taken in from customers that, that have helped the process? Well, the number one thing I learned is, is business is a lot more fun when you're dealing directly with customers. But in terms of feedback, there's there's no uh, one amazing story other than that one. Like yeah. what you do get in dealing with customers is lots of Little, little bits of feedback here and there and our attitude has been to look at whatever people are saying and address it yeah. so we look at every in- we look at every inquiry as a failure um i think amazon had the same attitude but most people say well customer service is like so important and you got to provide great customer service and our vision for great customer service was was really to get it's not possible but it is to get to know service because people don't want to talk yeah. to their vendors it's you want like to anticipate off. you anticipate their needs so they never have to ask essentially yeah you don't want to waste time in your day writing us an email i mean people think that customers want to talk to you but it's not true like you don't want to talk to me or you know our, our customer <laughs> service people you just want your product right so we look at every inquiry as a failure on our part and we say well what what, mm. what exactly was it that made this person feel the need mm. to talk to us you're and very then, process because, oriented. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Yeah. what's something simple that you've taken? Okay. Like most people like, oh, they just answer it and you think a little bit differently. So you get that and you're like, what cause, what can we put on our website or our process that would cause this person not to need to email us? Right? Yeah. So what would be, what would be an example of that? That's a great question. It's a difficult question for me because I, I, you know, for the first three years I did, for the first three years I did customer service. For the first two years I did probably 80% of the customer service. And then I gradually scaled back. I haven't done customer service for, yeah. for a few years. I mean, it could um, be, it, maybe it was simple as, I don't know, you put like an you know, FAQs page. I don't know. Yeah, oh no. I mean, our FAQs are probably the best that you, you know, I think we have the best FAQ section anyone's ever seen. Uh, we try to generally create an FAQ for every inquiry, which mm-hmm. for every, yeah, every reasonable inquiry, but yeah, our FAQs is probably the best that anyone's ever had. When we start this, this is an interesting point, when we started early on and you see a lot of companies do this still, they make assumptions about what people want to read in the FAQ. So they, they just write a bunch of FAQs and they're like, this is what I think people are going to ask me. But it's not necessarily true that your assumptions about what people want to know in an FAQ section are what they really want to know. So 
we ended up deleting a lot of our initial FAQs and, and building FAQs based on things people are actually asking. I was like, hmm. I'm not going to just put, you know, people put silly FAQs. Like, why, you know, why are you, why are you guys in business? And they write like their company right. history. No one, yeah, no one that. cares. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what was something that someone asked that surprised you? Anything? They're like, FAQ wise, uh, that you would add in there? You know, the funniest one, you know, early on, I mean, like I said, it's been a while since I've done customer service. I mean, I had, so we had, when I was doing customer service, we had phone support early on. And, you know, I had somebody call from prison asking to place an order for stickers. That surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> you have to hand deliver them through like a uh, yeah. glass. I was like, man, you know, I was like, this is nice. The guy so he uses like, one phone call for, for yeah. you? He was, yeah, he uses, I don't use his phone for What were contact. the stickers? I, Do you remember? I don't even remember, but I was like, this is oh. crazy. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, you know, because I was reading this, Anthony, about you. You have a certain obsession with simplicity. And that simplicity, I think, translates into a, like a, as frictionless as possible customer experience, right? So yeah. what have you guys done? Because I mentioned, you know, easiest, fastest way to buy custom printed products. What have you done in the, the customer ex experience to take away the friction? Uh, we, we remove everything on our website that doesn't add value, which I think you see a lot of people moving in that direction. But, you know, eight years ago or certainly a long, longer on the Internet, 15 years ago, people, they wanted to get their message out there. And, and a lot of businesses to this day are concerned with, like, pushing information onto you. And they're like, I got to get this on the website so people know because it's important. And a lot of stuff's just not important to people. So, we, you know, if you look at our website, you're really kind of hard for us to find anything on there that's not useful. And for people on the internet, you know, we had battles with SEO advisors that are like, you got to get stuff on the website for SEO. You got to do this. You got to do that. Or just, I said early on, there's the temptation to want to say things. Like that stuff you keywords matter. or do certain things. All that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of died. It still exists in e-commerce. Like if you look at the software as a service space, I think people learn to be real, you know, do really clean websites. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we don't, there's not, I don't think you can find anything on our website yeah. that doesn't add value. Like, there's just, there's nothing there just, that's just there just to be there. Like, one yeah. thing that even bothers me a little bit is, I, you know, I believe we have social icons in the footer, and I question if those should even be there because is that really adding value to people that, like, you know, I don't know. But to me, you know, we, we debate stuff like that. Um, yeah, you pay but, attention to detail. I mean, because there's a post of even your customer service responses, and you just, you know, one of the the rules you have on there is use as few words as, as you need to convey okay. the message. Yeah, you don't want to waste people's time. So, yeah, if you look at our website, I'm, I like to use as few words as possible. When I talk, I'm not so great at that. But when I write, I like to use as few words as possible. And we Well, you can go back and edit it, right? So Yeah, yeah. you got time. <laughs> we train our agents to use as few words as possible. How is the, you know, Anthony, how is, you know, simplicity in the business I totally get? Um mm -hmm. What, how does that trickle in your personal life? What have you simplified yeah. or what are some of your philosophies personally? You know, this does not trickle into my personal it life doesn't. at all. It does not. No, I have like an obsession. Like I picture you sitting, you have like just a couch and that's it no. because that's all you need is a couch and just. Oh no, I get, I get laughed at. And you're not mad everyone. I am, I'm very disorganized. I'm, people laugh at me for my level of disorganization. So at work, I don't know. I'm at work. I'm I'm, I'm hyper organized. I'm an obsessive organizer at work, but outside of work, it just I don't know. It's I think um, I have a hard time. Like I, I think to be successful in, in business, you have to be good at prioritizing, and I tend to deprioritize those things. You're just too focused on prioritizing the business. You go home and it's just like yeah, or whatever I need to get done. You know, yeah. it's like yeah, organizing the cupboard or you know, organizing. Uh, yeah, organizing my wardrobe does like not strike me as like an incredibly important thing. To Got do. it. Um, now your co-founder has been a big influence. How did you guys meet? Um, you know, he was a friend of my dad's and my dad passed away mm. when I was eight years old. And he, I think for that reason, he ended up kind of just looking over me and, and looking over me and my brother. He was also my brother's godfather. So we were just always sort of friends early on in my life. I wasn't the best student and uh, I was not a good student. I, I, I got C's in high school. And what were you he interested would offer, in high school? Like what, what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up in high school? Uh, you know, in high school I, I got highly focused into wrestling mm. and 
I, I debated going in, in the direction of that versus like collegiate. The, yeah. Yeah. And I actually, I got into college for wrestling. I got into RPI, which is a pretty, you know, which was where I ended up going. And my friend said to me, you know, you got to decide, you know, do you want to be, I don't know how he put it, but he said, basically, you know, do you want to be responsible or do you want to go out and have fun? Because he's, there's, there's no future in a wrestling career. Now there's mm-hmm. UFC and MMA, but that's not even that great of a future. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Actually, it seems to be like a super interesting future, but you get your head pounded in though. I mean, like when well, and those guys don't make what uh, NFL and NBA players make. And, and, but years ago there was no future. There was no future in that. Yeah. So you decided to go again, like that seems like an obvious choice now, but when you're that age, that's not such an obvious choice of, uh, you know, you can go have fun and, or be serious, right? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, chose a serious route. It helped a little bit because my girlfriend lived near RPI. So that helped a little bit. <laughs> it's always because of a woman. I got it. Um, <laughs> so your co-founder, he kind of helped guide you um, and kind of, you know, gave you some advice. When you left college, were you connected with him the whole time? And did you work with him? Yeah. I mean, we always stayed friends. Um, like I was, I was going to say funny stories. Like I, I learned in high school, I was not a good student, and he would help uh, tutor me. And I didn't tell anyone I had a tutor. And so I would, you know, mess around in school and really just seem like I was focused on sports. I was sleeping class. I didn't have a notebook. I didn't have any books. I didn't, I didn't have a lock in my locker. I, I just was very unprepared. But I did manage to get A's in math because, you know, he would tutor me once a week. And hmm. it was kind of fun. I, I got to go into school. And, and everyone thought I was this, like, bizarre genius because <laughs> – I seemed like I didn't care at all, and then I would go in and get an A in the class, and I didn't even pay attention. I was like, secretly, I had a tutor. So, um, you know, he, uh, yeah, he he helped me out through that. He continued to help me. You know, I, I, I think I started working with him as a tutor just because it was a way for us to maintain the friendship. So I would, I would contact him a lot in college and ask him, hey, can you help me with this or help him with that? So we, we stayed together with that. And then, you know, after that, I got right into manufacturing, uh, working for a local company. And with- I was uh, – yeah, was, was he asking. in manufacturing all at the time? He was, yeah, he was. In, well, he was retired. He retired before, I believe, just the beginning of my college career. He retired. Uh, just, just as I entered college, he retired. He retired pretty. He retired around age sixty. He had a really good career. But yeah, he was in manufacturing for forty years. He loved manufacturing, so I think maybe for that reason, pushed me in the direction of wanting to get excited or interested in manufacturing. I went directly into that, and we kept in touch with that. I always ran things by him. Uh, situations I had to deal with and ask them. So you brought him back out of retirement? Uh, Well, to start Sticker Mule, he actually, you know, we we had a conversation just before Christmas time, and and what happened was is he managed to retire without ever using a computer, and he had gotten to that point in his life without using a computer, and he had just gotten one uh, just before Christmas 2009, and he wanted some help on it, and I started... Be asking about uh, the, the idea of an internet-based manufacturing company where you wouldn't have to deal with distributors; you could work directly with the customers. And he kind of just looked at me and said, "I don't know. Okay, that's interesting." And, and went home. But then he came and saw me the next day and said he thought about it and we should start a company together. But he, he wanted my commitment, you know, right then. Really? So yeah. what are you thinking? That's a big commitment. I said, you know, I'll think about it, and maybe a year from now, that sounds like a good idea. And he's and I got to get back. And I said, yes, yeah. let me see how this year goes and I'll get back to you. And he said, no, he said, you're seven years too late. You got to do it now. Mm. This is a guy. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's funny. You never saw the Internet before. So um, we were able to also. So, you know, we were. Yeah, I ended up saying, sure, like, let's do it. And we were able to grab my brother, who was um, my brother at the time was uh, focused on a career. And he, he wanted to move in a direction of being a professor of Chinese history which is a totally different direction than me wow. in life but uh you know he didn't have any commitment so he was able to join us and help get the company off the ground as well so it was you know the three of us and another friend of mine we we had that conversation just before christmas and we launched i think in march or wow. april and uh he didn't really come i wouldn't say he came out of retirement i said he drove us to get the company off the ground and get yeah. it started and me and him have stayed friends but he, he never uh came into work although for the first six months he did phone support for us which was <laughs> why do you think <laughs> he had that urgency to make a decision or let's just not do it. That's his personality. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, that's his personality. And I, I've adopted the same personality for, for better or worse. It's, in business, you have, you have to have a sense of urgency. Um, yeah, you just, you just have to be that way. You just have to be that way. I think if you want to be successful in business, you just naturally develop that. Because you say to yourself, like, well, what's the most important thing I could work on right now? And, and you just do whatever whatever that seems to be. And I think if you're 68 years old and retired and you got a friend of yours that's in his yeah. 20s, I know. It's like you don't, to don't get a year to anything. think it over. You get right now. You have five minutes. Yeah, he's like, this. what else do I got to do right now? I mean, he's like, I'm 68. What else do I got to do? Like, let's get this started. You know? Yeah. And that's, that's just the way he was. You talk about this actually um, – asking yourself some questions periodically to improve your ability to prioritize. I think all of us need myself included, you know, I forgot someone was telling me about like, Oh, only in the U S we talk about priorities, like plural. It's really should be yep. priority one priority. Right? So yep. you ask some questions to help improve the ability to prioritize, which I really like. Um, so I don't know if you have some examples, but uh, walk people through the framework a little bit. The first is, question you ask is what's the most impactful thing you can work on so has there ever been an example you kind of stopped that in your tracks and just reversed what you were doing maybe recently because of that question you're like you're working on i don't know coasters you're like is this really the most impactful thing and then you switch to something else to give people kind of an idea sure i mean i, I mean without i mean there's some things i can't discuss because they're things we're planning in the future yeah and, you know, I don't tip our hand but you know uh a good one a good example is i'm gonna we live in a small town and uh there's not a large population there's a dwindling population and you could make the case that it's hard to hard to hire here and as we were growing people were making that case that it's it's hard to hire here and, and they were coming to me and complaining about it and saying we just can't find people and i said to myself well you know obviously this is important but i, I said to them i said well it makes sense we can't find people and they said why is that i said well we market ourselves nationally internationally but we don't market ourselves locally there's no business in our local community so our our, our local town didn't even know sticker mill exists so I was like, well, why would people think to come work here if they don't mm. even know we exist so after you know having that conversation with people i, I just went full force into getting our brand known in the community locally and yeah locally for the purpose of hiring and we went from not known at all to everyone knowing that there's this company sticker mill here that's uh you know pretty yeah, it's amazing. a cool hip company too it's not like you guys sell like glue sticks or something you know like you can apply to any company what were some of the things you did to get out to the local market uh we did all sorts of the funnest one we we just did is uh we, we took a friend we you know well i would I, it's better to see the commercial than for me to explain it but we did a really cool commercial and we contacted the local theaters and we're actually running a we're hiring commercial before every movie that's playing mm. So like I'm like that's cool. We, we put up billboards in interesting places, which turned out wasn't that expensive to do because not that many people here want billboards. So once you one, it's not that expensive to get, and two, once you get it, if you don't renew it and no one else jumps on top of you, you get to keep it for as long as. It want. is a so perceived like, huge value, though, if you see yeah, oh yeah, the company are, on the billboard. Billboard, and then yeah, you know, we did the funnest one. We did was uh, we did Burger Day. We did we made uh burgers for the whole city that was a blast we recently did a uh, soup day we made we did a soup festival and um oh wow and, yeah that we had 500 people come this weekend and, and uh you know eat, you know, eat soup and we had we had a band and the mascot we had our mascot running around we have a mascot now that runs around town and goes to sporting events and stuff like that really? so yeah i mean we're just i think like anything like once you you know, like, let's say the goal is improve hiring. So you say, well, my goal is improve hiring. Then you list out, well, what are all the things I can do to get the word out? And you just keep, you just keep throwing ideas down and, and iterating through them as quickly as you can. So we go after whatever we can go after, billboards, soup festival, mm -hmm. burger day, you know, getting an ad running before a movie is not that, not that hard to do. Um, we how got, did you come up with the name? Sticker Mule. The name Sticker Mule. Yeah. yeah. Mainly, I, I would say a lot of it came from my, 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 my friend, my co-founder that just pushed us to move quickly. Like we said, let's do an internet company. We didn't have a product yet when, when I said, let's do an internet manufacturing company. And we just moved so fast. We didn't have a choice. In fact, I think a, a few weeks later we went and we met our first developers and we contacted them. We said, look, we want to get, <clears throat> get going. And uh, we want to do a internet company and we want your guys help to get it started. And they said, well, what do you guys want to make? We said, well, it's going to be some manufactured product, but we're not sure yet. You didn't know so, at the time. 
no, we didn't know. Hmm. And they said, what's your budget? And my friend, you know, was an older guy, he said, he said, you know, we've never done anything on the internet before, and we don't know what the budget should be. Could you educate us on what we should expect? And the guy goes, look, I don't mean to be rude, but you don't know what you want to make. And you don't know what you want to do. You've never done anything on the internet before. Like, I don't think I can work with you. <laughs> so, That's a fair point, right? <laughs> yeah, it was a fair point. So we threw out a number, and he said, all right, I can see you next week. So, yeah, we gave him our number. He said, I'll see you next week. We went and saw him. And he said, you know, I actually really like you guys. He said, but you really got to decide what you want to do. He said, I could get started on this probably in two weeks, but you guys got to decide what you want to do. And so we, we we had a few ideas in mind, and we said, look, let's do stickers. It's, it's reasonably easy, uh, you know, reasonably easy to do. And I, I had the idea of doing, you know, or we had the sticker plus – or product plus animal because – it sounded funny. So we were like, well, what the sticker pair well with? Not like sticker badger. I, mean, sticker badger <laughs> I went to Wisconsin, pair. so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Sticker mule just sounded good. So, um, yeah. So that, that's how we ended up being sticker mule. And then we ended up, I said, all right, we're going to do sticker mule. And I knew a, a kid in the area is my age. And we, I, I didn't know. I wasn't a web designer. And I, I needed help designing it. So I went to him and I said, hey. You know, I know you, you got some, you know, you had a job. I said, I know you got a job. I said, but if you want to work nights and weekends, I can't pay you much, but we're looking to get a internet company off the ground. We were wondering if you'd like to help us design the website. And he goes, oh, I never designed a website before, but I always wanted to do it. So I said, all right, well, give it a shot. So this guy, kid, at the time, um, you know, he ended up designing the website in a week. We handed it off to the developers. They're like, this is awesome. And what he designed is very close to what you see today. Really? And he went on to become our lead designer, and now he's our VP of marketing. That's amazing. What were the other considerations, Anthony, at the time? You you chose stickers. What else was? Were you brainstorming? Do you remember uh, some of the other things? We thought about. Um, I think we thought about stickers, buttons. I don't. I don't recall. So it was smaller. We thought about item. packaging. We thought about packaging, like which, but that looked too complicated. We thought about that as well. Yeah. yeah, it just seems random. You're like stickers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, what you know, you don't guys think things just move, just right. move. Don't yeah, totally, things. I love it. <laughs> um, you guys obviously have manufacturing. You have, you know, there's this whole technology behind it. What's been mm -hmm. the hardest hire position to hire for? The head of technology was the hardest, but that's a cool story. We, we started with an agency. Uh, I mean, actually, you know, I'm not, I can't get into the whole story, but, you know, we started with an agency and uh, we, you know, they, they had they had somebody, we were able to steal the, the guy basically from them while remaining friends. And, you know, he was our original developer and he was our only developer for three or four years. And he was really reluctant to take over management. Why? Of the, uh, he just didn't think it was his personality. I don't know. He just you know, his skill set. He he was he saw himself as a developer, not as like a manager. Yeah, but you know that was that was the hardest thing. But you know we we have a rather you know, um, you know we have a rather large dev team now, and and he's he's scaled up and he's an outstanding manager. Every I think the team loves him, and he's he's done an amazing job of managing the team. But getting him on board initially and and getting him interested in wanting to run the team. It's totally know, different skill set, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Writing code and they're like, hey, you're going to have to actually talk to people, right? I mean, you, you stereotypically think of the developer as they're, you know, a num you know, they're crunching, you know, writing code. They're not necessarily yeah. stereotypically the outgoing people person, you know? Yeah. And we had that concern. I said, well, to be honest with you, I'm not an outgoing people person. Right? That's what I told them. I said, I'm not an outgoing people person. It doesn't matter. Like, you don't need to be an outgoing people person. People want a boss that is intelligent and, you know, respectful. Yeah, totally. What do you see as, you know, as you probably, in, I don't know if you coached him to improve as a manager or he just kind of, you know, as he's taking on a position, he's learning as he goes. What do you see as like a really key skill set for someone to promote them or to have them manage people? Uh, you know, the, maybe it's not a uh, politically correct answer but I, I would say that the number one skill set is like willingness to terminate because anyone mm. can hire but terminating people is, 
<laughs> is much harder to do. And um, that's I think that's the hardest thing you do in business as a manager, terminate people. It's, just, it's incredibly unpleasant. And that that really is like what, to me, makes the difference between you know, average or great manager. If you struggle with that, you know, you just, you just can't go that far. And um, yeah. How do you decide? I mean, again, it's a tough decision. You're probably weighing, okay, even let's say you like the person, right? What are some ways that you, and then also you are thinking, well, should I give them a different position instead of firing them or should I coach them up? At what point do you decide, okay, we've exhausted all options? Yeah, well, certainly you should uh, you should look for opportunities to place people in the right position for them. Like you shouldn't leave them in a place. So, you know, we always look for that opportunity. Um, you know, my general attitude, well, first of all, I tell people it's like, one, when we're bringing new people on, you want to, you want to make a decision about whether they're going to stay or whether they're going to go within three months. Um, cause you don't want somebody like lingering around. They're here for a year or two and then they get terminated because then every other person that's here for a year or two says to themselves, what could I go to? So our rule, first of all, is like, we got to make a decision quickly. I don't want people like lingering around. We got to make that decision within, within three months because that just gives the long-term employees a comfort level that like, this isn't the way that, you know, you're not constantly at risk. Right. It's like. The other thing that we did recently that really helped is we've gotten a lot more aggressive early on during the screening process. So we put a very, we, we, we make people go through four interviews now before they get a job, which at first I thought, well, that's not really nice to people because it's just, they have to go through hell to get the job. Maybe they're going to yeah. run away, but it allows us to have a lot more certainty that the job's going to work out, which is good for us and, and good for them. The third thing I'll say is I believe in treating people extraordinarily well and, you know, yeah, as good as you possibly can. And early on in my career, I got accused of, you know, being overly kind to people. And, you know, mm. people, my friends and people that know me, for, you know, you let you give people an opportunity to take advantage of you. And I'm like, my attitude is I'm going to be as nice as I can to you. And, and if somebody doesn't reciprocate back, that's a, that's a sign that they're not a right fit. Because if I'm going, if, we're, if the organization is going over and, you know, over and above to, to treat you well, and, you know, you're doing things that are maybe not the best things. You know, Why were they song. accusing you of that? What did what did you do that was overly over oh, the top kind? You know, I don't, I, I can't, you know, some of these stories are rather not get into, but I've given people, I mean, I've given people overly generous upfront bonuses and things yeah. like that. I, I, you know, I do everything I can to help people. Yeah, but, totally. Oh, you know, and but most most people don't go that route. I would say, you know, you got three out of a hundred people that would go the route of like being like, oh, well, thank you for that. Now I'm gonna like, you know, it, you know. Some people think if you're a nice boss that you're weak and they're like, oh, he's nice. He's stupid. You know, I don't know. Like, he's too, so nice. I could pull a fast one on him and, you know, I don't know. You, you get, but that's, that's not the majority of people. The majority of people are like, oh, I was, that's, this is like a really nice person or, you know, we, but I encourage all of our managers yeah. to be that very caring and concerned. I, I, I don't like to talk about stories. I mean, maybe I got, I don't, I don't like to talk about stories. <laughs> um, well, you have an interesting take on bonuses kind of on that route. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. your philosophy on um, bonuses? No, we don't do end of the year bonuses. We pay up front really well. Like your, your salary is really well. We don't do end of the year bonuses mainly because for me, I found it to be anxiety building for both sides. It's anxiety building for me because, of, you know, for management, because we're like, well, what's the right number? Yeah. <laughs> for, maybe I picked the wrong, a number too low. You want to offend <laughs> someone. There's like a yeah, lot of, yeah. Like, crap. You know, and then it's anxiety building for them because they got a budget around a bonus that they don't know what it's going to come in at. You could have a formula to do it, and I'm not. I don't like formulas because then people are orienting their decisions around how to game a formula. So I was just like, why don't we just pay people really well? And then you have certainty about what your compensation is. If you don't like it, you know, you can make your own decisions. But we we pay people well above market rates. There's no bonuses, and that, that works really well mm -hmm. for us. Um. Talk about the decision to expand internationally. Yeah, it's like a lot Most of Most people, stuff. it's like hard enough to, you know, have the one manufacturing U.S. and you decided yeah. to go international. Well, I said early on, we like to do things to amuse ourselves and we, we rely on serendipity a lot. And I think, you know, whatever it was a few years ago, I was online, I went on a sticker website at the time, it was called Unix, Unix Stickers, and they sold programming themed stickers. And was on there i think fairly late at night and the live chat popped up and said hey how's it going and i said hi i'm anthony from sticker mule and i said sticker mule i love sticker mule mm. i said i said great so i got a question for you why don't you sell to europe why do you care he said well i'm in europe I was like, 
oh, all right. I said, well, I said, where are you? He said, I'm in Italy. I said, geez, I thought you were an American company. He goes, no, all my customers are in America, but I'm in, I'm in Europe. Hmm. And I said, okay. And I said, well, you know, I don't know. It seems like a hassle. He said, well, you know, you, you have a great opportunity over here because there's no, there's no competition. And there's not much at least. And so I said, all right. And, you know, we kind of became friends. We started talking through Skype. And one day I went to Italy and I just found a message. Hey, I'm, I'm going to be in Italy. You want to hang out? And uh, I ended up hanging out with him. And my team was, came with me. We all hang, ended up hanging out for a few days. And we, we had an awesome time. And we became even better friends. And from there, we started working on. He helped us develop, a, along with his uh, partner, they helped us develop a marketing strategy to bring Sticker Mule to Europe. And that started going on along pretty well. And then from there, I just said, look, why don't you guys join us? And at that, that point, they were really happy with us. They ended up joining us. We absorbed them in, and we ended up that. That's how we got started. Mm. You, I mean, there's a, there's a video, there's a post on your site about kind of the team at Sticker Mule. And you guys are all over the world, yeah. right? So how do you how do you work as far as maintaining you know the the teamwork or culture virtually what what works and what have you found doesn't work i think the culture comes down a lot to like you know who are people you're hiring so we developed like cultural values and we actually screen people based on our cultural values so like i said we have a four-person interview process and people have to give people a rating on a scale of one to five for how they fit based on the conversation with our cultural values that's like one of the things we look at mm -hmm. early on and i think our most important value is humility we don't really do well like i don't think anyone here really dealt, deals well with arrogant people so we naturally screen out that so we, we naturally have a very humble modest culture like nobody's in it for themselves that's why i really haven't done that much speaking um but yeah, nobody's really in it for themselves. What else? Um, I think that's the root of our that's the root of our culture because we're I don't know, it's just for whatever reason when we all get together, even if we don't know each other very well, it's just like a, a lot of very intelligent, modest totally. people, and you just, they just they just like each other. Yeah, when you get a bunch of that's giving, well. modest people together, things just click. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So humility is one. What's another cultural value? Uh, we like people, what did I say? Humility. Humility is the biggest one that stands out. Um, the other ones we look for people that have good, uh, good logic, good reasoning. You know, we look for people that are, you know, it's hard to evaluate people on that, but you know, we say we want people to be, uh, humble, independent, because that's another thing that happens here. You're not really, most people are self-managed. We, people self-manage via metrics. So everyone that works here has metrics. You need to be able to set your own priorities. Um, so yeah, we look for people that are humble, independent, have good reasoning, thoughtful towards others, and, and we say autodidactic or ability to self -te self teach. Uh, for example, yeah, a lot of our people here have had very humble beginnings to get to get to where they got. We haven't hired. I don't think we've hired anyone with a fancy degree. Mm. So what would you say? Uh, I mean, I know a big influence for you too, um, Anthony. Early on, I don't know. Uh, is your your high school wrestling coach right uh -huh. what did he teach you uh you know wrestling taught me that well that gives you some humility said, you know like you, yeah, yeah yeah well he told me he said look he, he, i was a terrible wrestler first of all until I, I met him i was i was probably like the worst there was i in fact i lost every match in under a minute i lost my first 30 matches in under a minute which is i think a record for badness <laughs> wow it was, it was terrible. I, mean, I have the, I have the, you know, not that it's much, but I have the best record in my in my high school from from my final year. So I made a big improvement. But the reason it happened was he said, you know, you need. I want you to decide where you're going to end your career at. And for whatever reason, I said, I, I don't know. I I was so bad that I said I was going to end my career at second in the region. I don't know why I picked second in the region, but that's what I said I was going to do. I, I wrote it down. But I ended up ending my career second in the region, which was the best finish for anyone in my high school. Mm. And I ended up doing it. I was like, I realized after that, I was like, you're never going to do better than what you expect to do. Like, if you go into a wrestling match and expect to lose, your chances of surprising yourself with a win are slim to none. Mm. If you think you're going to be at best second in the region, yeah. your chances of like That's becoming what you're gonna get. You know, a, a national champion, you're not going to lose that. Yeah, that or less. That's all you can do, that or less. And so I learned that, you know, you got to set ambitious goals and, you know, you can surprise yourself and actually accomplish them. 
uh, you know, that's what, that's what, that's what I learned. And then as far, I learned as far as business in general goes, what I saw in wrestling was, you know, I wanted to be second in my region, but there was a lot of kids that just wanted to be the, the toughest kid in their school. They're like, I want to, you know, they were so happy with that. And then there were some kids that wanted to be the best in the region. And there were some kids that wanted to be the best in the state. And there were some kids that wanted to be the best in, in the, the nation. And then there were some kids that were like, I'm going to go to college and be the best in collegiate wrestling. And then some people had dreams of going and winning Olympic gold one day, you know, all the way in high school. And I just, you know, you're going to end up where you want to think and you got to set your target for where, where you want to be. And so in business early on, you know, I, I set pretty high targets. I've always said like, I want, we always have measured ourselves in business against, I try not to drive ourselves to drive us too crazy, but you know, we, we measure ourselves against companies that are pretty good. Like I think, I mean, Amazon's clearly the best in e-commerce business. So I could run around and say, Oh, I'm a good company. I'm this, I'm that. And like a lot of people do that, but compared to Amazon, I'm a terrible company. It's all relative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Who you compare yourself to, you know, they're, they're the best in the business. It's it's who you compare yourself to. Um, cause, because if your goal is second in the region and, and, um, like I said, my coach said he saw, he said, when I got to the finals of the regionals, he's like, I knew you weren't going to win because you, he's like, I saw how happy you were just to be there. Mm. And a lot of people in business, you were content so already. Yeah. A lot of people in business, they're like, they're, they, they get to a point where they, they're just so happy because of what they did. They got yeah. X number of people working for them or whatever they accomplished. They, they've hit a level that they're happy and you can drive yourself crazy if you set your goals too high. Another person said, you got to say, well, it's good enough. Because you can drive yourself crazy. Because is it really worth it? But yeah. So Anthony, yeah. what kept you going? So thirty matches, a record of mm-hmm. losing in in instantaneously <laughs> under a minute. Yeah. Why did you continue? I, I mean, really, at I that point, were, did you love it, or what, what did what was it about it? Oh, I, just, I just didn't want to be a quitter. I mean, I saw a lot of people quitting wrestling. We had a tough coach. A different. I had two different coaches. One was less easy to work with than the other, and. A lot of people quit. We we had to run five miles a day. It was it's not an easy sport. It's not a oh, fun totally. sport. Oh, totally. Know? I remember you know, playing basketball and then the wrestling practices looked grueling. I'm, I was thinking, thank God I'm not in wrestling right now. Yeah, it's not a fun sport. I, Why'd I just, you continue? I just didn't. I didn't want to quit. So you knew you were going to stick it out till all four years. I don't know if I. I don't know what I thought. I just didn't. I just didn't want. I mean, I saw a lot of people quit. And I just didn't want to be one of those people that quit. I don't know. <laughs> You know, I eventually started developing friends and whatnot, but I don't know. I don't know why I stuck with it. I was, I was, I, I was not good until my last year. What caused you to improve? Was it extra time? It was, was just it mindset. What no, was it? it was. It was just a change in mindset because, and I, I, I started, you know, interacting with high school wrestlers again. At the high school level, you really just don't understand. I didn't understand the extent to which mindset is a difference. Like no one's that good at high school wrestling it's like the mind because you're you're losing seven to four i mean as you start getting better like, okay you lose seven to four that's you, your attitude can make or break that three points easily hmm. but when you're a kid you don't know that when i first started wrestling i was i was terrible and there was, was like the best kid on the team it's a big guy he was like you know heavyweight and tough guy and everyone thought he was you know tough guy and football player too and he, he said he's he's told me he said look the sport's 90 percent mental 10 percent physical and i'm like yeah you're just saying that because you got the muscles you're right. just trying to make me feel good but it actually turned out it is true i just i just decided i remember i just decided i didn't want to lose anymore and i just didn't lose anymore amen you, you go back in the final you go back and speak to the students you've gone back and spoke. Yeah. what did you yeah. what did you tell them I think I, you know, I talked to them about, about this, that like you got to set your, you know, I told them that I'm not trying to remember what, you know, but basically I, what I told them that they could relate some of the things they're doing in school. Now they don't understand how it relates later in life. And I was a bad student, but like I learned a lot of things in, in high school that had nothing to do with like classwork. Like you can apply this idea of, you know, who you measure yourself against with anything. I said, you could, you could apply it with, with uh, video games. I mean, there's kids that are outstanding at video games. And if you can learn how to become an outstanding, like, video gamer, you can learn how to become an outstanding anything. It's just, you, but you have to learn the process of, of, of setting your sights high and doing it. So it doesn't need to be academics that you're learning in school. It could be, it could be anything. Yeah. You know, it was wrestling, could be track and field, could be chess, could be golf, could be yeah. whatever, you, whatever you're into. What do you do now to keep the mindset strong for business and the goals strong? Do you talk to certain mentors? Do you listen to certain books? What what kind of things do you do to keep sharp mentally? 
I, I, can't, I can't say I do that much. Like, what honest. motivates you? You know, if you see Amazon topping, you know, best companies, does that motivate you to say, like, how can we get to that point? Or I, I, I'm motivated a lot by my coworkers. You know, we have awesome people. We have a lot of fun together, and and we've been able to bring in a lot of people. You know, we brought we built a team up a lot of, over the years. I've got my core people I started with, but they love all the new people that have joined. They're, they, they, everyone is really excited. I think it's been really fun over the years to bring in new people and make new friends and stuff like that. And the core, my like my core group that I, I hang out with, they want to see the company keep growing. I think they they probably motivate me more than anything because if they didn't, if they weren't excited, I don't think I would be excited. Yeah, you know, from the early customer with GitHub. Um, What's been another favorite fun story of how you got a customer? Because you, you have premium big name customers. I'm sure you have a lot of small mom pop customers and it ranges, but you know, we're talking Amazon, Nike, Google. Is there a favorite story that sticks out of how you, you know, some randomness of how you acquired and got one of these orders from, from one of these companies? Unfortunately, no. No. I mean, after you know, we haven't done acquisition of individual customers. It's just, I focused on experience. Just, I focused on experience and marketing after that. I didn't focus on going after customers. Um, you know, we've had plenty of fun stories, uh, you know, with us, you know, traveling and being crazy and, and whatnot. You know, we, we have a lot of fun together. Um, but, but yeah, no, we, we haven't had any interesting, you know, acquisition stories since then, mainly because it's just, just we haven't focused on acquiring individual customers. Yeah. Any interesting stories of actual goods? Like you mentioned the guy in prison. Any interesting companies order packaging or buttons or labels that you're like, why are they ordering this stuff? <laughs> like random company. It's the ones that come to mind, I probably shouldn't say. <laughs> okay. I figure that's why I asked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. N- not appropriate uh Something like I look at them, I'm like, what is, I, 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 okay. what is this? I couldn't like figure out what it is. And like Google is like early on, it's like, like, like a swingers club. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's better. It wasn't you, anything you inappropriate. Whatever. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, so Anthony, first of all, thank you. I always ask this um, because it's Inspired Insider. I always ask one, what's been a low moment um, that you pushed through? And then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment that you are especially, you know, from from the journey um, you're proud of? What's been a low moment that you had to push through? Uh, I'll say, you know, probably the worst moment. There was a point, you know, I, I say you kind of go in waves in business where your job should be easy because if it's hard, you know, you, you're probably not going to be able to succeed for very long. So, yeah, but every now and then, you know, it's going to get hard because you're taking on new challenges and you should be able to adjust. But there was a point when we were growing quickly and, you know, I didn't, I had never built up an executive team before. And, you know, I just didn't really know how to go about doing that. And I was like, all right, well, now we're getting to a point where I need somebody in charge of manufacturing. You know, I, I, I ran manufacturing, I ran customer service and I ran a lot of stuff. I was like, all right, we need somebody in charge of manufacturing, finance, marketing, you know, and I, I built out a whole executive team. And it was very stressful. I just didn't feel like it was going really well. And, and uh, I started talking with some of the people here that I had known for a while about the people that we had put into place. And they didn't really know either, I don't think, what to do. Because, you know, none of us had ever built an organization before. And they were like, yeah, I see your concerns. But, you know, we need people to do these jobs. And I don't know, one day I just said, no, this isn't, this isn't right. And I, 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 I terminated half the executive team. Mm. In, in a week and people were you know and people were freaked out <laughs> it didn't feel right to you something didn't feel right it didn't feel right and and people i don't think i had anyone that really backed me on that decision but a month later everyone thought it was you know it was great i was, I was able to i was able to take actually some people that we had brought in i had brought in people and, and i was able to give their jobs to people that have been here since day one so if you look at our executive team now, it's all people that have been here since day one that have scaled, and they're they're amazing. Like our our VP of fine of uh, HR has been with us since day one. Our VP of finance has been with us since day one. Our head of software has been with us since yeah. day one. They grew I'm internally. Currently, yeah, I'm currently yep. I'm currently overseeing manufacturing. I've obviously been here since the beginning. Um, 
we have plant man, a plant manager that's been with us since very early. She's, she's, um, you know, started, uh, actually in another part of the company and she's now our plant manager and she does an outstanding job. And yeah, that was, that was a hard decision to make because I, I pulled people in and, and I said like, I pulled people in, I used money to entice them to join us. And I just said the people I picked weren't the right ones. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was the most stressful. It's tough. It goes back to what you're saying with kind of being a manager. It's like really difficult to terminate someone. You know what I mean? If it's not, yeah, I think out. it's worth telling that story because a lot of people, I think, will if they're in growing companies, will, or even whatever, it's smaller companies, they feel this pressure to bring in experienced management. Um, and that's not always the right move because I don't think any of these jobs are all that hard. Like, you, you know, it's most jobs aren't that hard. You just have to, I don't know, use, use common sense. But, uh, you know, these jobs aren't that hard. You just have to have a desire to do them, use common sense, and have a good attitude that, and willingness to learn. Um, so, what, what about yeah. on the flip side? Uh, proud moment. I mean, you've been doing this for for many years now and you started it with you know with nothing on a whim an idea um what's been a proud moment i think besides the billboard and there's flip coin you know on the flip coin and on the flip flip side um you know making hiring mistakes sucked you know and and fixing that was very stressful especially when i made like executive level hiring mistakes but uh uh you know problem was like I've, I've had to do a lot of recruiting too. Like early on, like every CEO is a co- growing company. You got to get talent, and it, it's been really rewarding for me to be able to go and connect with people and to convince them to join us. Like I had to convince a lot of people to join us that had good jobs. Um, mm. You know, so I think you know even calling the shots. So, you know, I got our original developer. I got him to you know he, he, he wanted to leave his job, but you know I, I got that situation sorted out. Yeah. And, yeah, we've, I've, I've, we've been able to bring in a lot of great talent. It's always fun. I have, you know, amazing friendships because of that. Like, I have friends in Italy now because of, you know, a live chat conversation. I have a ton of friends in Italy now because... Random. Online, yeah, I love yeah. it. So, that's what it's It's basically be. putting that's, putting that Rockstar team together makes you proud. Sounds like... I mean, the fact that I get to hang out with these people all the time. And the fact that I was able to convince them to join and that they come in and say that they... You know, a lot of them say it's the best decision they ever made. So, I mean, I think that's, you know, somebody says that. (laughs) Totally. Well, Anthony, thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you. This is fantastic. I love hearing your stories. I love that. I mean, I don't love that you lost 30 matches in a row, but I love the story. You know what I mean? And the persistence behind it. Um, And so everyone should check out Sticker Mule. More importantly, check out stickermule.com slash inspired. And if it's still available, you get 10 custom stickers for a dollar. I mean, I don't even know what you can get for a dollar these days anyway. So 10 <laughs> custom stickers, even, you can't beat that. You can't even get a soda for a dollar anymore. Exactly. Right? So, so, and it's your own company logo that will look nice on a computer or wall or wherever you want to put it. So, Anthony, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. And thanks, Kieran, for putting it together. Thanks. A lot of fun. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand